great pleasure to take you to the stage prop, Jonas. Um, known him for a long time, uh, and uh, he's here really because of his innovation and and persistence in bringing forth a lot of the thought patterns and a lot of actually the mechanics of how we might actually do precision medicine, targeted therapy, multimodality monitoring. It's been a dream forever, as Douglas Miller was doing in Edinburgh decades ago. But I mean, when I spent time with him, I could see that he was showing us it was possible that he was doing it by intuition. And that's hard to teach. Um, and I think 30 years later, we've come up with a lot more bits and thoughts. We all realize it's possible, but we still don't have it systematized. Howard, with his innovation in the area of cerebral blood flow monitoring and persistence in, in integrating into ICU sort of scientific multimodality monitoring, I think it has given us a lot of the tools that will allow us, at least now, to an ask questions, and they're not all answered yet, but in a way that hopefully in the near future we'll be able to systematize precision medicine and make it something that isn't done by the CD parent. So if I can ask Howard to take us through that. Well, what a pleasure to be here. Um, if the expectation is I've got the answer, sorry. we're on a road. This road's been going on for a long time. It's going to continue for a long time. And as we get better technology, we get smarter, we get better tools. We're getting better, better information. So this first slide was just an effort. I pulled that out of an article by uh, Martin Smith and, and the various technologies that are available that you can monitor. Well, there's tons of them. And there are tons of them because not any one of them answers what you need to know. And so, focal information is dependent upon these probe business. Generally, it's focal information. So, where are you going to put your probe? How are you going to interpret it? What are you studying? Old, young, male, female? I think the elephant's a great analogy. What are you going to look at? The ear? The tail? You're going to understand the elephant from the ear to the tail? You're going to look at a leg and an ear and a tail? You need to look at the whole, you know, how do you do that? How do you look at the whole elephant and understand what this beast is and what it's doing and, and what your role might be? So this is just a short talk. And obviously you only cover a tiny little bit of the story in a short talk. If you want to invite me back for a few months, I'd be glad to do that. Okay, well, I'll pass on that. But after training at Case Western Reserve in the 70s, uh, actually with shape, uh, I learned that we could do bypass surgery. I thought, well, this, this is really cool. We could really hook vessels up, and this was going to be the future. Um, it became apparent to me very quickly that we needed a physiological indicator for a hemodynamic procedure. We can't just be plumbers. We're not just plugging this into that and thinking we're going to get somewhere because we have to understand the hemodynamic need. We have to become physiologists. We can't just be a plumber. So you got to understand physiology. you got to understand what's behind the scenes. you got to understand autoregulation. you got to understand this pet data on the right and the relationship is uh, you begin to compromise blood flow and, and blood flow falls down as you lose autoregulation and the system compensates by vasodilating. And, but at some point you run out of, you start to also compensate by extracting more oxygen. So you get oxygen extraction going up. We'll come back to the oxygen extraction story because you have a tissue oxygen monitor. Is that a little PET scanner doing oxygen extraction measurements? Should you think about it in that way? And then vascular reserve is if you kick the system, does it have vasodilatory capacity? Does it have reserve? And we've done a lot of work showing that reserve actually answers a lot of the questions above that you didn't really need all the PET data to know where you were in that story. So because very few of us actually had a PET scanner, um, we began to ask questions like, could we change one variable? And that's the recurrent theme of the talk. Can you change one variable and then look at what it does to the system? Can you change blood pressure 
And obviously, if you failed auto regulation, you're on the slope there, and you change blood pressure, and very, very quickly you've changed uh, blood flow. You've changed oxygen extraction. You've changed all the other variables by changing one variable, blood pressure. Or you could do a vasodilatory challenge. You delta CO2, you give a drug called Dimox, a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, increases local acidosis. So you could do a vasodilatory challenge. So then, okay, now we, we've got concepts of how we might I isolate the question or the problem. Um, what I worked with is I needed a tool to measure what I just said. And so we had to develop this tool. This is a tool using the inhalation of stable xenon, which is the radio dense. You can see it like iodine. If you put it in a glove, you put it in a scanner, it's white. Uh, xenon is radio dense, but you can breathe it. And you breathe it, it jumps on your, your red cells, it gets transmitted to the brain within seconds, and saturates uh, gray matter within two minutes. And white matter catches up eventually. And you can teach a very fast, a very smart computer how to extract high-resolution, tomographic, quantitative cerebral blood flow from that. And we validated all of that information. It truly is quantitative against multiple other modalities and basic technologies. So we really had a quantitative tomographic tool. So I, I'm also showing this slide because of, you're going to monitor the brain, and where exactly are you going to monitor it? Uh, look at the heterogeneity of blood flow. You're going to put it someplace that's gray and white or white and gray. It's 50% this or 30% that. And if you did that, how would you monitor one patient and the next patient? How would you interpret the data from one patient to the next if one was in white matter the next day or in gray matter in another patient? Is it really all the same? Well, it's not. So the picture on the far right is a little arrow looking at the deep white matter. The deep white matter gives you a chance at some homogeneity of blood flow, of physiology, gives you a chance at being able to isolate some variables and uh, 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 get what you, you theoretically should be wanting to do. So we developed a methodology. Um, Cerebral blood flow by itself is tough because just like oxygen, tissue oxygen, it depends on so many variables. Neurological function, acid-base balance, blood pressure, a lot of variables there that determine. So can you look at one number of blood flow, one number of oxygen, and think you know where you are? And the answer is uh, no, because of the variability. If you're extremely high or extremely low, you have some idea of where you're going and what happened. But anywhere in the middle, it's very, uh, uh, you, you can't hang your hat on it. <clears throat> Occlusive vascular disease, perhaps, you close down the big input, maybe the system vasodilates, maybe you give Dimox, and then you look at vasoreactivity. Maybe that's a game you can play. <laughs> so this is one of my early patients that I, uh, I keep showing because it's a gorgeous example. The picture, CT on the left, in the middle is a baseline xenon study. Patient just breathing, laying on the table, blood flow. You see the correlation between gray matter. You see the little injuries in the frontal lobe, and you see there are holes in the blood flow on that top um, uh, center picture, and then all those white matter changes on the uh, lower level. But does that tell you what the need is? Does it tell you anything more than the patient's been hurt? Well, then you give Dimox, and you get this picture on the right. And you stand back, and you look at it, and say, well, wow, that is, that is remarkably different. You see, most of the brain, the flow goes up, like it should go up, 30 40%. But there's a segment of the brain where the flow fell. What the heck is that about? Why would the flow fall in a, in a territory? And it just happens to be in the left middle cerebral, anterior cerebral artery territories. It just happens to be in a patient with a carotid occlusion. The patient just happens to have leptomeningeal collaterals filling into that area. A patient has ischemic claudication, stands up and shakes a little bit on the hand. And so it looked like 
maybe we really had a technique to identify patients at extreme hemodynamic risk. Sounds illogical. And we had a good tool to find it. And um, it was this uh, Dr. Barnett up in London, Ontario. I went up with, visited with Henry, and I, I said, well, we have this great technique. This is a, a great technique to identify patients who are in trouble. And uh, we want to do all these bypasses, and we'll compare them against your database from your, your stroke studies. He said, Howard, don't do that. <clears throat> just, just study these people. Leave them alone. And if you see that some segment of them have strokes, and they happen to be the ones you predicted, you've made a big contribution. So, you know, surgeons just want to do stuff. And he said, Howard, don't do stuff. Do not do that. You have an opportunity. So I actually followed 68 patients, symptomatic carotid occlusion, quantitative blood flow. And this was the first publication that actually said there are different groups. There's a group with a 34% stroke rate. There's a group with a 4% stroke rate. And the 34% stroke rate was a patient group whose flows started out a little low, a little bit below 50, maybe 45, and you gave a challenge, they fell greater than 5%. And they got a 34% stroke rate. Well, that's, that's cool. That was the first demonstration of a, of a group at risk. Uh, three subsequent quantitative studies have found the exact same information. So it's been reproducible. Just for a historical perspective for the surgeons here that know that bypass surgery is useless, a uh, cost study didn't do quantitative blood flow, didn't do quantitative oxygen extraction. It did qualitative studies. But we already had done studies that showed that qualitative data did not find the group at risk. And guess what? They didn't either in cost. They found no high risk group. Therefore, they found that bypass surgery made no difference. Well, wait a minute, if you don't identify a high risk group, and you're doing a plumbing procedure, how can you expect to show a difference? So is this a failure of bypass surgery? No, it was, a, it was a failure of the methodology used to identify. So methodologies, questions, are you asking the right questions, do you have the right tools? Uh, failure of cost, no. Uh, just for the fun of it, uh, Xenon CT was just made very difficult by the US FDA. The last challenge I had was I needed to generate $100 million to go back to the FDA to do the next NDA trial, which uh, I, I can't generate. Some government can maybe do that for us. But the sad, it's a sad story because this is a great technology, it has a lot of utility, has a lot of, and, and there's this new scanner that this company came up with, which is infinitely slicker than the serotonin you may have. Much faster, more levels, less radiation, easy to move around. A bigger bore size, you get, it's easier to use. Uh, lots of really good reasons. And so I really wanted to give this thing rebirth in the United States, and uh, this company said, uh -huh, we can't spend that kind of money. We're gonna develop this in Asia where Xenon's already approved. And they're doing that right now. So not in the US, you know, cutting edge of uh, science and all that. <coughs> but it's gonna happen somewhere else. And then the company says, we'll bring it back to the US maybe when we have enough scanners sold or something. Meanwhile, uh, the technology is taken away from us. So before digging into the multimodality concept, uh, just let me throw out a few cases where I'm sort of asking the question using a Xenon experience. So head trauma, uh, you're gonna put a probe in someplace. Where are you going to put it? How do you make that decision? Yeah, we usually go somewhere like that, frontal lobe. Uh, but if you had a study like that at the same time or shortly later, would you put the probe in the same place? Would you put it in dead tissue? If you put it in dead tissue and you didn't know it was dead, how the heck would you interpret the data? It's meaningless. You have to know what's underneath your probe, around your probe. <coughs> Is it representative of the rest of the brain? Or is it just this focal spot in the middle of dead tissue? You have to be able to discriminate that. So there's a scan the next day. The Xenon study was the day within a few hours of the first CT. 
The next day, the CT, you see that's all dead tissue. Zero flow is absolutely predictive of dead tissue. Okay, let's just play with a few concepts. I got, a, I got an old man. Uh, CPP is running in the 50s. Um, we're going to turn on dopamine. We're going to run the blood pressure up. We're going to get the CPP up you know, above 60. We're going to optimize him. He's got this clot. Obviously, he's in trouble. But he doesn't like having his blood pressure elevated. His, his heart is not tolerating it. He's getting rhythm problems. So uh, what do you do? You, wait, you do this funny study. And you see that, well, there's a clot. And flow looks pretty homogeneous around. And really, the flows are in the 40s or something. Uh, certainly not ischemic. That doesn't look bad. OK, can I drop the blood pressure? Well, it, is it only because the blood pressure is 180? I can't tolerate 180. So you drop the blood pressure. I go to 130. Dopamine I turn off. Blood flow went up. It did not go down. So do we know, what do we know about the vasoactivity, reactivity of these of phenylephrine and dopamine on the cerebral circulation directly? Do they have a vasoconstrictive capability? They actually published one paper with norepinephrine. We have data for dopamine. Same thing. These drugs are vasoactive in the brain. If the blood-brain barrier is open, not normal physiology. We don't treat normal people. These are sick people. And so are all our assumptions about normal physiology valid? Uh, no. So here we actually took the drug off. Blood flow went up a little bit. Patient heart got better. Everything's stable. Life's great. Here, 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 here's a perplexing problem. Left carotid dissection. Looks like I've got an infarct on the left side. Um, we reduced the CO2 to 28 because the ICP is 34. OK, ICP is too high. We're going to reduce the ICP to 24. Did we do something good? Are we, are, are we right? Then you get a full study, and you say, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. The, the dead area looks like it's hot. And the normal good area, it's got a lot of purple areas, so that's below 8 cc's per 100 grams per minute. That's ischemic. Are we helping this patient or hurting it? Are we treating the dead tissue or are we treating the brain tissue that's alive? So we, we raise the CO2. We raise the ICP. ICP, you know, is evil. When it goes up, obviously the world is bad. You're going to make all your decisions on ICP. But Look what happened to the normal brain on the right side when you raise the CO2. Look what happened to all the ischemic white matter in the second level when you raise the CO2. All the ischemia went away. So what were we treating? We treat ICP? Is that the question we're really asking? Is that the variable we need to understand? OK, I'm beating you up with Zeno. I'm giving one more case. This is just fun. So, 12-year-old, TBI, ICP, 34, CO2, we've already lowered it to 20, 31. Oh, wait, we don't like that ICP. So, uh, well, I can't lower CO2 any lower, right? Because we know we can't go below 30. 30 is a floor. That's that magic number somebody taught us. So we got a flow study just for the fun of it. And, wow. At, 34 ICP, CO2 31, uh, this kid's actually hyperemic because he's comatose. His flow should be you know, around 40s or something. Here he's up in 60s. So he's hyperemic. He's not ischemic. Can I, can I lower the CO2 lower? That's sort of a common question we ask. In my, the other case, we caused ischemia. In this case, we lowered the CO2 to 27, ICP came down a little bit, flow is still homogeneous in a relatively high normal range. So how do you make a decision how low you're going to go? Where's the barrier for CO2? That's based on you know, empiric observations. If you go below some number, it's bad. But every patient is different. <laughs> and if you don't know that patient's physiology, you're, you're really, you're really uh, Terribly hampered. So now I'm halfway through my talk, and I haven't gotten the multimodal monitoring. Except I've given you some ideas about where you're going to monitor, what do you need to know. Um, 
So then I turned to what I did have uh, as they took away my xenon, and I said, well, I've got, I've got ICP. <clears throat> I can measure ICP, and that's going to give us good information, and we can maybe use that to build the program. But then I've got, I've got Randy over here who publishes a paper that says, well, I don't know, ICP maybe didn't make a big difference. And uh, is that really the modality you really needed or something? I, I come back, his control group wasn't exactly a control group. That was a moderately aggressive treated group against an ICP directed treated group. So it's, you know, it's, <coughs> literature is uncertain and Randy's building a great career and contributing to that area tremendously. So focal probes, this is an animal we cause the stroke in. You can see it's evolving over time, studying it every hour. You see the strokes evolving. And you get, with a probe, you get focal data. Focal data tends to be continuous. You get a lot of information from one spot. Tomographic data tends to be episodic. You get a look, maybe you repeat it again in the afternoon or the next day. And so ideally, my belief is you need both. You need to understand where your probe is and how you're going to interpret it. Okay, let me talk a little bit about probes and stuff. So I got all these things I want to monitor and I sat in the ICU and I decided because I'm the doc, I can't go to a patient's family and say, I'm going to put seven holes in your son's head to monitor all this stuff. And so we worked with the company and we developed a technology, we called it the Hummingbird, and there's lots of other technologies, but the concepts that we evolved was where do you want to target? My belief is if you're aiming for targeting the lesion or the perilesional flow or physiology, that's tough because you don't know where it is. And then you want to look patient to patient. Where do you have your probe? And what relationship to dead? And, and very confusing. So my concept was <coughs> go to the other side. Go to the side that's not dead, that's not contused. And, give you a window to global physiology. Where do you put the probes? And you put one probe and you put them one here and one there. Um, you have to cluster them. They gotta be in the same physical relationship, I think, all the time. So I'm in white matter, same physical relationship, 60 degrees of arc off the center core. And then when you compare patient to patient, you begin to have information, you say, well, I understand this patient and I begin to get a database. I get physiology. Two and a half centimeters below gets you in deep white matter over the cerebral cortex on the other side. That's where most of our probes are clustered. This is this hummingbird technology which added a ventricular catheter, a pressure monitoring from the, from the fluid, as well as a balloon around the outside of the catheter. So I'm getting ICP from fluid as well as focal tissue. And then through the other ports, you can put down any variety of probes that you want to put down. Another system that's out there is by Fred Bowman, Clyde Bolt, similar concept, of, but decided that you don't need CSF drainage. And, and so you get another probe in the brain, but you don't get CSF drainage. And there's some of that Actually, for a lot of critical care people, that's fine. They didn't understand there was any role for CSF drainage. Uh, we actually went and looked at uh, a series of trauma patients. We have a tissue monitor and a ventricular monitor, and we got a tissue oxygen monitor in a series of head injured patients. And uh, we examined, because we have all their continuous records, from the moment of CSF drainage, what happened to brain oxygen? for a significant group of patients. And what happened in a significant number, if the ICP wasn't raised, not a whole lot of anything changed. But if the ICP was raised, tissue oxygen came up. And in half of those patients, it went from, quote, ischemic, below 20, to above 20. Now, is that relevant? I don't know. I haven't done a prospective study playing that game. But it seemed to me that's some of the first physiological data that says draining CSF affects brain physiology in a way that might be beneficial. 
Uh, I think you have this system. So, uh, Moberg uh, designed this, thinking mainly, mainly about EEG. Side port, now we can input all the technology into one common <laughs> computer. Is that important? That's critical. Because if you have a nurse at the bedside who every half hour puts a number down on a chart, and not even at the same time, the different variables, and, and maybe every 15, whatever, and you want to look back at the last hour or two hours or 12 hours or 24 hours and understand something, the answer is you can't. You need continuous data, simultaneously grabbed, stored simultaneously, and then so you can access it and look at those variables, periods of time, and the variables that you want to look at. The next part of our equation is we added a big server, the first group with Moberg that developed a big server attachment, so we captured every patient and all the data. And we've got now like 800 patients data, aneurysms and trauma patients, all their data is stored. But the next part was, so what? What do you do with all this stuff? The next part was looking at a computer on the side and a smart person attached to it. I'll come back to that in a second. Technologies, what are you going to monitor? Blood flow, I'm rather enamored with blood flow. <coughs> Be very honest, my bottom line is down there, although there's useful information I can extract from a, from a blood flow probe, when we put it in every patient every day with head trauma and ask, what did we learn yesterday, what did we learn today, at least half the time we learned nothing or the system didn't work or we couldn't use the data. And after a lot of money invested and a lot of time spent, I said, we have to stop doing this. This is not productive, and it broke my heart, and it broke Fred Bowman's heart. Glycox, it gives me oxygen data. That's it. It should be a good thing. It's going to be linked. We know that the relationship, blood flow, and oxygen. Um, and that's a reliable, good system. It gives consistently good data. The company made a brilliant assumption somewhere about three, four years ago that nobody uses this information. And therefore, we only need to report to them maybe every two minutes. We're going to average every two minutes and give them only that. The machine actually turns out data just about every second. But they hide it from you. And you don't have access to it. <coughs> so with the aid of my cohort, we found out how to extract real data continuously online to integrate it with other variables. I think that's very important. Microdialysis. Fantastic concept. I've spent a lot of money and a lot of time and gotten very little out of it, and I couldn't get a reliable system to work. Electrophysiology, EEG, some places do a lot of EEG work. We haven't. Cortical spreading depression, some people are focusing a lot of attention on that, either cortical leads or depth electrodes. I haven't focused a lot of attention on that. There may be an important future there. And then NEARS um, is something we've put on almost every trauma patient, an aneurysm patient, uh, now for lots of patients. And uh, for cardiac surgery, where the heart's going to stop pumping, it's an amazingly quick feedback loop if you're not ventilating the patient or we found some very interesting things. It's good in pediatrics for sure. We put it on our, our adults and our children. For me, the thing that I take away from NEARS more than anything else is in children that uh, I get very high values after head trauma. I got 70s, 60s, that's hyperemia. That's, that's really high, often correlating with high ICP. But wait a minute, that's hyperemia, that's not ischemia. That's, and so do you treat that with mannitol? Hyperemia and reason I said, no, I mean, that'll make it worse. So this is a group of patients you hyperventilate a little bit, don't mess with them too much, and hyperemia goes away. So NEARS, I think it has a future. There's various machine companies that are building whole systems of probes around the brain and a lot of things that should be a, a future, multiple modality way of looking, not just at one or two probes. Originally, they gave us one probe, and I went back to the company and I said, no, 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 I can't work with one probe. You've got to give me at least two. <laughs> 
And so the future is going to be many. All right, so where are we? We've got, oh, we've got tons of data. Here's 12 days of data, continuous data. We can bring it up, put it on a screen, and we see lots of stuff's going on in this patient. MAP is going around and goes up, and oxygen stays sort of stable, and ICP goes down, then comes back up, and blood flow goes down and goes away, and the patient dies. Can you predict that course from something on this data? Can you predict? Can you change your management at some point based on something? It's tough. So let's consider some simple questions. If you have a Lycox, which gives me tissue oxygen, and I have CPP, okay, ICP and MAP, and I interface the two, oh, you know, how do I do that? Well, I need Mark. I need a really smart person. He's an astrophysicist who I brought from Wisconsin. And long story. But I brought him into the world of physiology, and I gave him all the knowledge I had, and I said, Mark, think about this business as a physicist. What would you do with all this data? How would you integrate it? How would you analyze it? And the first thing he did is he took all these machines apart and understood how they worked, understand what the Lycox really gave us and how to fix that. He needed new approaches on how to integrate data of multivariables and needed to be able to look at it continuously, not just once in a while, and print it out regularly at the bedside. So he gave us a lot of new ways to think about it, and the hardest job for me was <coughs> keeping up with where he was going, because he would come up with ideas that I, I well, what does that mean? I don't know. But it turned out in a little bit of time it began to mean something. So here, here's two variables, uh, tissue oxygen and uh, CPP. I'm integrating CPP. <coughs> so is a patient auto-regulating? Can you make some decision based on this? Does it mean anything? <coughs> well, if you just plot the two against each other in time and point, you begin to see something that's interesting. CPP of 60, you see there's, there's a lot of tissue oxygen values that uh, or down there around 20, and you see this sort of like, almost like an auto-regulation curve. Um, tissue oxygen comes up, and then as you get above 80, it levels off. In this patient, for a 24-hour period of observation, 24 hours of data. Well, that's sort of interesting. That's sort of a simplistic way that, you know, even probably a trauma doctor might understand. Just kidding. So which monitor do you want to use in the ICU? You want, you know, you want the one on the lower right. And so in many of our patients, uh, these heat maps uh, are really very interesting, and it depends on the time and the course of the patient. Most head trauma patients are way to the left. Uh, we have a lot of people who are monitored, and we get recorded values below 80s, and we get, CO, we get tissue oxygen well below 20s, especially on day one very common, and then they, they stabilize a little bit, and that curve comes up, and they stabilize out. The website gives you data, printed out, and loaded up every 15 minutes. You can access it in any way you want. You can look at any patient. You can look at all their data. You can look at any notes that have been made on the patients. You can look at any time interval. They go in a two hour, eight hour, 24 hour period. And on the, on the screen below, you can pick any day of any eight, 12, 24 hour period, or all of it. You can smear all the data or get it as small and focused as you want. Well, that, that answered a lot of the questions we'd always had. You know, what happened with well, last shift? What, was, what led up to this problem? So here's a patient. It's, it's a nice story. So a 40-year-old woman uh, is progressing through in an automated way, I apologize, but what you just saw was on day one, the patient, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, the patient's not supposed to jump forward, sorry. We're doing fairly well on day one to five to six to seven, 
And then on day eight, we see a sudden drop, even though we're spontaneously hypertensive. Our tissue oxygen values are now down well below 20, down below 10. And even with a CPP, you're getting near 100. Oh, wait a minute, this, that's a problem. And the very next day, they're even worse. Most of the values are well below 20. Our CPP values are ranging from 80 to 120. The patient's very hypertensive. We've now adding to it. At that point, we went to angioplasty, and uh, uh, the patient stabilized. The exam became increasingly confused and, and non-following. And here is uh, 24 hours after angioplasty. Looks like making some sense. She's in a re reasonably good perfusion range, and tissue oxygen is okay, and she stabilized and did all right. Did the tissue oxygen data provide something that correlated with physiology, with the neurological cores, with the late deterioration on day seven and eight, to give you an understanding of what was going on? That ICP, I'm sorry, that raising blood pressure, she was already at 110, 120. Uh, means. So we're, we're, we're in big trouble. And it gave us the information and feedback to intervene. The website has been really useful. Let's ask some simple questions that we could ask. Now you got all this data stacked up someplace, and I could ask my friend, uh, Mark, would you uh, tell me if young people have a more variable CBF uh, on different days than older people? Less than 25, over than 25. And there's tremendous heterogeneity, and young people are very hyperemic. They can become, and these are all comatose people with probes in their brains, so normal flow should be 30s and 40s. And here we're up in 60s and 70s. So what kind of insights can, can, you, can you gain? One of the populations we've, we all work with in the, the vascular areas uh, aneurysm patients, we give a drug called amodipine, we give a dose, we see blood pressure falls a little bit, and then we worry about should we be reducing the dose or giving it more frequently with a lower dose, and how do you figure that one out? And so um, if you looked at MAP data, tissue oxygen, and CVF data, you see that they really correlate perfectly in some patients that are not auto-regulated. And if you some many hundreds of challenges that the patient's getting, you can actually get physiological data. Any one patient could be any one of those lines from any one dose. So this is not the different doses. This is all of one dose repeatedly, and you see the variability. By averaging it over a shift or two, you begin to get physiology. And you see there is a predictive drop of blood pressure or MAP uh, that occurs, and as we went to Q2, it becomes significantly less, and Q1, significantly a lot less again. And my question to Mark was always, well, that's okay, but what's, what is the tissue oxygen doing? If you drop the blood pressure, it doesn't matter if tissue oxygen didn't fall, because you're not challenging the real question. And then we have a high number of patients where, in fact, tissue oxygen fell profoundly and you can then average it. And now you know, okay, I do need to cut this drug. It is doing harm. We're getting into an ischemic range. We make some decisions about what we're doing based on real patient data and physiology. Autoregulation, that's it. Autoregulation, it's like five, six syllables, a big word. Do we know what it means? How do we interpret it? How do we measure it? Um, sure, it's that relationship between blood flow and, and MAP. And you see, there is a relationship. If you look at it really carefully, it's not an instantaneous relationship because of the technologies you're using. So your blood flow probe has a delay. If it's a tissue oxygen probe, it has another delay and it has some other issues in technology. How do you line these physiological curves up? So then you can do an analysis. If you don't understand how they relate to each other, you can't examine autoregulation on a systematic way. 
Is the patient auto-regulating? Is, is that obvious from this data? It's too much. If you do a simple correlation of MAP and blood flow, simple correlation, does one correlate with the other? So if one changes very profoundly and the other changes very profoundly, that would be a one, full correlation. And if one, if blood pressure changes and blood flow doesn't change, there's no correlation. It's not that complicated. So here's a patient, we start out and there's remarkably good correlation between MAP and CBF. And then after a few days, magically, it goes away. And all of a sudden, we're down around zero. There's no correlation. It's a complicated story. The, at the end, the patient dies, and that's that upsweep at the end. But I'm not going to want to take you there now. Does oxygen data give you the same information? Can you do that correlation of curves and do an analysis of autoregulation and print it out continuously at the bedside? Yes. Can you do it with oxygen data? Yes. Uh, is that interesting? It should be. We know a lot, we think we understand autoregulation when it's really dysfunctional is a bad thing. Um, how do we fix it? Here's the same analysis, map against ICP. Oh, wait a second, I just said that uh, we had autoregulation was non, was not intact during those first few days. And here's the same analysis with MAP and ICP. Uh, it isn't apparent that autoregulation is not working. Well, that's sort of important because this is a recurrent theme because there's a whole world in autoregulation built around ICP, MAP correlation. And, and so is there a, a truly good one-to-one -one correlation with MAP and ICP? And the answer is it's tough. And the Cambridge group were the first ones that will tell you that. And they came up with that approach. So here's another way of playing this game. Now, this, this is where I need Mark. It's my, physi my, my, my uh, astrophysicist who I've brought into the world of physiology. So here we have a delta CDF. Delta MAP, percent change, in this same patient. And you see that for a little change of, of MAP, there's a big change of, uh, of, of CBF, upper curve left. Okay, that sort of makes sense. Change of one causes a dramatic change of the other in a variable greater. But the other variable I said to Mark, Mark, I need to know what the MAP was. Where are we in the world? Is a patient hypertensive, hypotensive, what's going on? So in color on the right, and then you look over on the, uh, the scale on the left, you see that where autoregulation was gone, blood pressure was lower. Now you have to know that. I mean, how do you, because that you can treat. If the patient's relatively hypotensive, and he's not, I mean, he's 70s, 80s, um, 90s, and yet autoregulation was dysfunctional. And then on the right, you see the, eye, the blood map comes up higher and higher into the blues and the high blues. So here you're integrating percent changes of two variables against a baseline um, physiological value so you can reference it in space. Where is this patient? And now where is the reactivity? And so that's, that's where you get a little bit uh, even more interesting. I'm going to run out of time. And here's the ICP analysis, same kind of thing. Uh, it isn't apparent that there's a significant, there's a zero correlation between ICP and MAP. For the same time, autoregulation using other variables were very abnormal. Uh, another recurrent theme that you're, 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 you're given is that the answer is in the PRX value, the pressure reactivity index which is the work, brilliant work by the Cambridge group and very thorough and looking at outcome data and great big databases. Say, if I got ICP and I got MAP, what do I have? How, how do I use that? And what can I learn from it? Um, theoretically, ICP shouldn't change if you change MAP a little bit. But if it does, that's bad. And so 
Not bad. That means you're not auto-regulating. That's sort of by definition. And they do a high frequency, moving time series, Pearson correlation, <coughs> between ICP and slow wave arterial pressure. I've read that sentence 30, 40 times, whatever. I don't know what it means. But when I look at Mark's graph of just a simple correlation of two variables, it's very obvious what it means. Um, so, for, so the software, you have to use their software to do that, sort of non-FDA approved. And very often, you don't get good data because you have to get a big, wide range of blood pressures to do that analysis. And your patient doesn't often give you that much data in any period of time. A simpler approach some people have used, and I think Randy indicated, maybe you just jack the blood pressure, bring it up 10, drop it 10, and look at the response of ICP. And that probably gives you the same answer. Um, and it's a lot easier at the bedside. So the care is monitoring with different technologies, ways to analyze the data, some displays, some different analytical packages to begin to extract not just two variables, but now three, and then in the future, you'd want even more variables displayed in a, in a very complex manner, which very smart people, unlike me, have to figure out how to do. Um, it took only till last year that I got all my, I got, began to get outcome data that I could put back into my physiological database. And I began to focus on day one. My question was, could I say something on day one that predicted where I was going at the end of the day? A lot of trauma data, a lot of things that say that should be where the money should be. And so we started out with aneurysm patients. Mark chose 200 aneurysm patients. Uh, we put all the variables on the table. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, GCS, and it's sort of interesting. If you just had GCS data for all your patients, uh, how, how often did a, uh, a GCS of three initially predict a good outcome? Well, it was 10% of the time. It wasn't 99%, it was 10%. You missed it totally. And 50% died. But how predictive is your data? And look on the other side, if your GCS is 15, what percentage of people died? Well. Around 10%. Complicated equations. Is GCS uh, stroke scales? Is that is that all we need? So Mark took all the data, and um, now we're talking about ICP on day one. We correlated it against outcome data, and we say, well, is there some correlation between ICP and uh, outcome data? And the answer was, it's arachnoid hemorrhage patients. The answer was, uh, not significant. We looked at CPP. Did that predict of any correlation? No. There was no unique breakout. So that next question, because I'm going to build a, a rationale based on tissue oxygen, I said, well, wait a minute, Mark. Maybe pulmonary edema, their oxygen levels are low. Maybe that's what you're dealing with. So peripheral oxygen was peripheral oxygen, low. Uh, is there a subgroup? No. There wasn't any predictive value in that. But when we looked at tissue oxygen, uh, that broke out something interesting. We have a group that has a much higher incidence of death. Um, if CPP and peripheral oxygen are not prognostic, what do you do with tissue oxygen change? So here's how you break this data apart. And you know, if your tissue oxygen is below 23, maybe optimally that might be the level you want to be shooting for. 55% uh, of people go home. But if it's uh, less than 80% of the time, less than 23, 80% um, of patients die. So now we've got another variable. And you know, you've got to ask yourself a question. Why? Why is tissue oxygen a parameter in this equation? So we ran the same analysis for our TBI patients. If we looked at CPP in TBI, we don't see anything predictive. 
But if we looked at ICP, we certainly break out groups that have high, high ICP and, and bad outcome, low ICP, good outcome. But the CPP was identical. So what the heck would tissue oxygen mean? Because tissue oxygen breaks it out also. But it wasn't a peripheral oxygen issue. It wasn't delivery. It wasn't blood pressure. And it wasn't the CPP compromise because they canceled. So what, what, what would you do with that? Because now, now we're just raising questions. What, what does this stuff mean? Uh, why is tissue oxygen low? It's not a delivery issue. Is it an extraction issue? Is the patient ischemic? That's been a debate in head trauma for a million years. Is it low CBF and low because of low metabolism? Or is it because of ischemia? And is it delivery of oxygen? Or is it utilization of oxygen? Is it a microcirculatory <coughs> metabolism ischemia issue at a microcirculatory level? That's the question. And this is, raises the question. So here's physiological monitoring data and you're extracting and getting questions. And now you can begin to direct the question, is it enough to just raise the O2 delivery? Well, that ain't, that's not the issue. They don't lack oxygen delivery to the brain. There's something else going on. There's another variable. And we're not getting with it by just monitoring tissue oxygen alone. So, in summary, uh, do I have all the answers for this game? No. Is a single monitor sufficient? Definitely not. We need continuous data. We need to integrate tomographic, tomographic, episodic, and focal continuous data streams for best understanding the elephant. If you ever want to understand the whole animal, you got to put all this stuff together. Continuous integration of data and continuous display and access from the clinician to this information is critical. We're evolving tools. And in the world of artificial intelligence and fast computer processing, we are just at the cusp. We're just beginning to open a box. And it takes really smart people, not like most doctors, but you've got to bring people from different areas into our world and say, think about our problem. And that's where we're, we're going to make a difference. So uh, ho hopefully you think some of this may be of some use. I certainly have enjoyed sharing it with you. Sorry, I just had to run, but that was a really amazing talk. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is we are going down the same path, you know, as spinal cord injury research, where we started the same way we monitored pressure, and there we saw that the loss of, loss of auto regulation, exactly the same correlation. And then we came to the conclusion that we can't monitor on one particular spot because, you know, every little area is different, right? So you have to penumbra, you have to impact areas, so every one probe monitoring is stupid. Uh, one thing that, you know, like we are seeing more and more, and so there seems to be one variable missing. Uh, and I was wondering what your, um, especially the capillary bed, what your ideas, what the, when you look at the capillary, capillary from the material side to the venous side, how much the venous pressure sort of plays into the equation? Because uh, you know, we, have, we have now monitoring that we can actually see the venous flow, uh, and there seems to be some very distinct differences uh, in stuff. Have you, do you have any opinion on that? I mean, is there any chance to, like, in a patient like that, sort of decrease you know, the venous pressure so that they can perfuse that area better because at some point there's nothing else left. There's some articles by a guy named Edna Modo, and I've worked with Ed for many years, and he's, he's interested in shunting. The interplay between the arterial and the venous side, and as you begin to increase the venous side and the outflow, you begin to develop shunts. Yeah. And the shunts would cause ischemia because you're bypassing the tissue. And so, this is a really interesting question. <laughs> um, so there's, the, the articles by Nomoto are fun. Uh, again, we're just asking questions. What is the role of each of the variables? What is a shunt? 
why, why, why does the arterial blood bypass the tissue bed and what parameters cause that? And raised ICP causes that, causes shunts. And I'm sure tissue pressure and uh, spinal cord injury is identical. I mean, I think one thing that runs through this, two things actually, is A, that ICP is an ICP is an ICP. And worshiping ICP as head injury is a complete mistake. Um, so heterogeneity, both within patients and between patients, over time and in between patients, is important. And having probes to actually tweak things and see what happens and to identify these subgroups is probably why our RCPs are failed. It's certainly why the best trip trial didn't show it because we have two groups where we all lumped them together, and they even all have intricate hypertension. So, you know, I don't think we had ten groups that were lumping together. Yes, exactly. No, uh, and and so we we're not going to make any headway, no matter how much money we spend, until we start being able to actually do this. Now, theoretically, doing it is wonderful, and, and but being able to do it at the bedside with the patient is a real crucial thing. And I think that's probably where you and Mark have come a long way. How do you convince the bean counter? I mean, our bean is about as user friendly as a hedgehog, and and we can't. Talk. You managed to talk your bean into giving you the indirect back, so you had funds to do something you knew was important. But talking our hospital administrators into allowing us to put together an integrated IT system in the ICU and and you know start looking more again at the Xenon CT is a real. How do we do that part? Because if we can't do that, we'll never make it real. So I cheated. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I became the chairman. Yeah. I decided what was priority in my unit. Yeah. And I built the program around my priorities. And because the program was cash positive, no one asked. Nobody questioned me. <laughs> you were doing great. So it's it's money, it's it's hospital needs, it's meeting the budgets, but focusing your you know, everything I've got is money here, I, I reinvested into the program. Yeah, yeah. And, and then finally, I think, I mean, I had the Xenon in OHSU for a while. It, it was the best tool I've ever had in hand. I would go back to using a, a Gigli saw for any automation, if I could trade my Mida. Um, is that available? Can we, can we bring that here as, as a study tool? Or something? Because it's so valuable. If I can get together Claudia and yourself, yeah. half a dozen other good people, and we go visit Neural uh, Office, we made this brand new scanner because they want to sell the new we scanner. Need a new scanner. And you need a new scanner. Yeah. So that's the game. That's okay. the leverage arm. Any other questions? Tradition here is, I'm going to give a talk. There's logic. Talk, but